Hi everyone! Hi. Welcome to Head Talks. It's exciting. We're starting a brand new series, and the series is what? Espionage. Yeah, I don't even think I had to write the word up there. You probably could have guessed just from that uh, graphic that I chose. I really love that. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a series on espionage, and we're going to kick it off with the, one of the most exciting sad, tragic stories that I think I've ever told in here. Do you know who we're talking about today? Yep. Yes, Matahari. Yes, there she is. So we're going to tell um, her whole story and we're going to find out how she becomes Matahari. Now there are a lot of names that I'm going to um, mispronounce, or I predicted that I would. So I've asked Trudy if she would help me out. Happy to do it. She volunteered, actually. She she volunteered, so she's uh, that was very nice of you. So I can pronounce Matahari. So we're so I'm good at least for right now. But this next one I'm going to need some help with. She was born in the Netherlands, and this is the town that she was born in. Leeuwarden. 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 Okay, I'm going to leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, All right, so this is, so this is um, where she is born, and her birth name, of course, is not Madhari. All right, that's not, how, that's not how her parents named her. Her birth name is, go ahead, Trudy. Margareta. Gertruida Zeller. Oh my gosh, thank goodness you're here. <laughs> and she was born August 7th, 1876. Now she's got a pretty um, interesting dad. He's, he's very much a character. Um, yeah, he's a haberdasher. Um, he was a hat salesman, he sold hats, but that's not where he made his money. He made his money in some very wise investments in oil. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, in oil. He made some investments in oil. And so he actually becomes pretty wealthy. And when he becomes wealthy, what he is doing is he's just kind of full of himself. He gets very, very full of himself. And he starts telling people, he starts dress, dressing very dapper, and he starts telling people um, that his background is much more elaborate than it actually was. He's telling people that he's a baron. He's telling um, people that he knows royalty. He's just really exaggerating. Um, his background and uh, people are buying it because he's pouring all the money into the um, into the things that you would need to perpetuate that kind of, of a falsehood and so he provides his family with a beautiful home his oldest child is Margareta 
and there's, uh, she's, got, she's got four brothers. She's the only girl, and she's the oldest child. And she has the finest dresses. She has the finest things. They have the most up-to-date and current, whatever is uh, new on the market at the time. The Zell family has it. They also are able to send the children to private school, so they're getting a wonderful education, a great education. All of these things are important to know. It influences her. Um, you can see these influences resurfacing later on. All right, now she is striking to look at even when she's a young girl. One of her classmates is quoted as saying, she was an orchid among dandelions. So she has a very striking look. She has an exotic look. Now, unfortunately, her lifestyle goes on like this until the age of 13. And when she turns 13 years old, her father goes bankrupt. Oh, God. Loses all the money, loses all the money, and then um, the tragedy gets worse. It just gets more and more. It spirals out of control for her. Her fortunes just completely turn around, all right? He then abandons the family to go off with his mistress. So now there's no money to support them, and he leaves them. And so there's now a mother with these children and no income. Now, it then gets worse. It gets worse for her. A couple of years after her father abandons the family, her mother dies. All right, so the only, the only one taking care of the children is the mother, and she passes away. So now all of the, uh, all of the, all of the children um, have no one to take care of them, and so what happens, do you think? They, yeah, they, well, they get, uh, they get shipped off, they get split up, and they get shipped off to different relatives. Oh, nice. So they go to different relatives. Margareta goes to her godfather. She goes to live with her godfather, and she is going to be a kindergarten teacher. All right, she's studying to become a kindergarten teacher, and she's in the school, and she is... Um, this is going to be her profession. This is going to be her life. But then something, again, horrible happens to her. And the horrible thing that happens to her is the headmaster, the headmaster, she's 15 years old. She's only 15. And the headmaster notices her and is inappropriate with her. Is inappropriate with her. So, of course, Everybody does the right thing, right? Everybody's going to do the right thing. They're going to fire the headmaster and protect yeah, right. the young lady. No. No. No, that's not what happens. So she is expelled. She is kicked out. He keeps his job. He keeps his job. And then she has to live with this shame. She is living with this shame. So now we have a young lady. Now at this point in time, she's, um, she's just about 18 years old. She's 17, 18 years old. And she has no family to speak of. She's with her godfather and um, his wife. And now this thing has happened. She's brought shame. She didn't, but there's shame brought onto the family. And so she really is desperate, isn't she? She's desperate. And so she's looking in the paper, and you know, it wasn't uncommon at that time for men to put ads in the paper for a wife. It wasn't an uncommon thing. And so she feels like she just doesn't have another option. That's her only option. So before I get to the result of that, I, while I was looking for such ads, I came across one that is so charming, I had to share it with you. <laughs> it was so, so completely charming, I just wanted to share with you. So this is an 18-year-old young man from Maine. It has nothing to do with our story, but it is so, it's just, just so cute, I have to share it with you. 
All right, so if you can't read it, it says, Chance for a Spinster. It starts out, a young man in Maine advertising for a wife speaks of himself as follows. I am 18 years old, have a good set of teeth, and believe in Andy Johnson, the Star Spangled Banner, and the 4th of July. I have taken up a state lot, cleared up 18 acres last year, and seeded 10 of it down. My buckwheat looks first rate, and the oats and potatoes are bully. What every I, woman looks for. <laughs> I, I've got nine sheep, a two-year-old bull, and a heifer besides a house and a barn. I want to get married. I want to buy bread and butter, hoop skirts, and waterfalls for some person of the female persuasion during life. That's what's the matter with me. But I don't know how to do it. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> no, don't you want to call him? I totally want to call him, but this is in the 1800s. <laughs> I think he's long gone. But I came across this, and I just, I, I, I thought it was the most charming thing. So yeah, so he didn't know. I hope, I hope it all worked out for him. <laughs> I hope it did. He just seems like a great guy. All right, so, so Margareta finds an ad in the newspaper in the Netherlands. And she's going to respond to the ad because she doesn't feel like she really has much um, choice. She doesn't really have a lot of options open to her. And one ad that she responds to is from this man, all right, Colonel Army Captain Rudolph Mc... I don't know, McLeod. McLeod. All right, so he's, but he's, he's called John, but we'll just call him Rudolph, okay? Um, yeah, Rudolph. So she answers the ad from this man because this man is going to, yeah, he is about 20 years old than she is. Yeah, about 20 years old, but you can see she's 18 years old. Do you understand how desperate she is, how destitute she is? And none of the things that have happened to her so far are, are her fault in mm -hmm. any way, in any way, shape, or form. All right, so she feels like she has to do this. They meet, and he sees that she's beautiful, a beautiful uh, young lady, and so they get married, and here is the photo. Oh, my. What happened to his hair? I know, well, this is, this is younger, oh. and this is older. Oh. Yeah, that's a much younger photo of him. Okay, so now this is, so, so yeah, he's 20 years older than her. So they get married, and this is something that she feels is going to solve her issues because of his status. What does it do for her as his wife? Yeah, she celebrated back where she started. Exactly, and I'm so glad you said that, back where she started, because what was the first half of her life? Mm -hmm. It was spent in she was in the lap of luxury. And if you're 18 and it all came down at 13, that was only a few years ago. All right, so she is trying to get back to where she feels um, she belongs. And so she wants to be a part of this level of society, and that's what this marriage is going to do for her. It does something else for her as well. He's the, he, so, he, so he's a captain, and he is stationed in... The Dutch East Indies, all right? So he's stationed in Indonesia. And we have a photograph of her traveling on the ship to arrive. He's the commander of the garrison there. So he's the top guy there. And we have a photo of her. She's right here on the left. There she is on the left. And she's going to this, this incredibly exotic land, all right? I mean, let's think about that for a moment. She's going to Indonesia. Is that something that's completely outside of her world? Oh, yeah. Completely outside of her world. <coughs> think about what she's seeing. Let's take a look at what Margareta is seeing, all right? Yeah. Look at that. It does not look like Kansas. 
Or the Netherlands. Or the Netherlands. Oh, look at this. Wow. I know, amazing, right? Yeah. I know, it's so, can you imagine? You, you, you would imagine her head must have been spinning. Oh, gosh. Yeah, look at that. Now, what about, what about the women? What about the women? So she, these are traditional Indonesian costumes, but this is what they look like. Amazing, right? Yeah. Yes. How about this? <coughs> it's, it's stunning, isn't it? What language do they speak? Indonesia. Indonesian. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? All right, now I did get color photos that are current. All right, so I did amplify this a little bit, but still, I'm going to bring you back just for comparison, I'm going to bring you back to what she looked like when she came. Remember? Yeah. All right, so that's how they're dressing. That's how the upper class are dressing where she comes from in her world. And she arrives at this world. And again, that's black and white. I understand that. But still, look at how exotic that is. What do you think, what do you think her reaction to that was? It must, have, it, it, it must have just been incredible and exciting. It had to have been thrilling for her. But, of course, it doesn't go, um, it doesn't go well. It, it, it does not have a happy ending. So once they arrive and they get settled, Rudolph, remember Rudolph? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is not taking the, this uh, marriage seriously at all. He drinks, he drinks a lot, and when he drinks, he becomes abusive. He gets physical with her. He's physical with her. And he also, what? No luck at all. No, I know. It's awful. It's, it's, it's awful, the, just the things that just continuously happen to her. And then he also is out with women. He's out carousing all the time. <coughs> And if she has a problem with that, well then, he lets her know, roughly, that she's just going to have to put up with that. All right, so she is, um, she's dealing with that, and in an effort to give herself some happiness, while she's there, um, she decides she's going to take dance classes, because she just wanted to do something um, artistic and expressive, so she does. She takes dance classes and she learns traditional um, uh, Indonesian dance while she's there. Now also, they have two children. They have two children. This little boy is Norman, that's Norman, and this is Louise. He's the oldest, she's the youngest. All right, and there's Rudolph. And um, there is no polite way of saying this. <laughs> Rudolph contracts a dis. Oh, worry. Right. I was gonna say. I was gonna. I was gonna be a little more discreet. But you all call out syphilis, so that's exactly what it was. <laughs> Thank you all for being to the point. <laughs> so of course um, he passes that along to Margareta. And then what does Margareta unfortunately do? She passes it on, so now it's passed on to the children. And sadly, 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 little Norman, when he was two years old, had an overdose of the treatment for syphilis, which was mercury. Mercury was the treatment of the time, and the doctor treating this little boy, he's two, and gave him an overdose and he died. He died of an overdose. Can you imagine what she's going through? Can you imagine, uh, can you imagine having all of this come down on you? So as soon as his term is up and they go back home, all right, now they, they're gonna go back to the Netherlands, what do you think mm -hmm. she's gonna do once she gets home on familiar ground? Because she was totally a hostage there, wasn't she? Yeah, she files for divorce and she also files for 
uh, custody because they have the little girl, Louise. Mm -hmm. They have little Louise. And she wins custody and she wins child support. She's granted child support. But do you think he ever paid one penny? No. He never paid a penny and there was nothing she could do. There was no recourse for her. So she is struggling. She is really struggling. The court also ordered that little Louise have visitations with her father. So while she is visiting with her father one of these times, um, he just decides he's not going to give her back. He's not going to give her back. He's going to keep her, even though in court she won custody. Uh, but what, what does she have? Does she have any income? Does she have any way to go and fight for this? She doesn't. She doesn't. Not in those days. Yep, there are no agencies. There are no organizations. There are no anything um, to help a mother in this situation. And so she never sees her daughter again. After all of this, after all of this, when did she oh, I'm glad. I'm. You know what? You're you're on track with my thinking. What did she say? She said it's a wonder she didn't commit suicide. Oh. After all of these things that have, that have happened to her in a few short years, you would think that she would be so defeated, mm -hmm. that she would be so defeated that she would just slump mm -hmm. into some, something. Yeah. But that's not what she does. That is not what she does. It is at this turning point, it is at this critical point in her life that she invents Mata Hari. She invents Mata Hari. How All right. old is she? She's like uh, 20, 21. 20, 20. Yeah, 20, 21 years old. Okay. Yeah, all these things happened to her in a very brief, like horrendous things have happened to her. All right, so she knows she can't get her daughter back. She'd never seen her daughter again. All right, she knows she's, that's uh, not a fight she can fight. And so what does she do? She goes to Paris. Is there any better place to start over and reinvent yourself than in Paris? In the late 1800s, early 1900s, there is no better place. It is where all of the artistic people are going. The economy is good. They finally have a government that has survived for more than a few years. There's some kind of um, established economic growth and culture that's happening in Paris. What else do we have in Paris? That's exciting. Yeah, all these exciting things are happening in Paris. The World Fair is in Paris. And, uh, it's just a very, very, very exciting place to be, and it's full of possibilities. It's the perfect, perfect place to reemerge, right? Yeah. So she decides that's what she wants to do. But what? How? How can she do it? How can she, how can she come on to the Paris stage, world stage, in a different way, in some kind of new way. Who's saying it? Dance, dance. Dance. She's going to dance, but she's not going to just dance. She's not just dancing. Do you know what she's doing? She's taking her clothes off. She calls herself Matahari, which in the Indonesian language means eye of the dawn. Eye of the dawn, which is the sun. Which is the sun. Like the Indonesian See? Yes, that's why it's important to understand where she came from. All the all the pieces will add up. Oh, right? All the pieces will come together. She changes her name. Uh -huh. All right? Um, what did the father do when he got his fortune? Invested. He he reinvented himself. Edith got it. Edith got it. So she saw that. She heard her father. He reinvented himself and he made up all kinds of, uh, you know, fabulous 
uh, uh, tales of his background and people he knew and all, and all these things. And so now she knows she's got these exotic looks. And she's taken some dance classes, but is she a professional dancer? No. So she can't rely on that, can she? So she brilliantly comes up with this new style of dancing whereby she's wearing all of these veils and what is she doing with the veils? Taking them off. So what has she invented? Stripping. Not <laughs> Trudy. <laughs> Trudy says stripping. I called it exotic dancing. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. She invents. She's the, she's doing this, and she's doing it. She's doing it in a, a classy way. Yeah. All right. Now, if if anyone thought that it was, you know, unseemly, well, then she just acted like this is an ancient cultural traditional <laughs> dance, and if you don't understand that, then I'm. Sorry that you're not, you know, that you're not in the know enough. What? You're not with it. You're not, with it. You're not cultured. she's in Paris. Yes. Well, she's in Paris. That's another thing. Yes. So she invents this, and she gets really, really far with these veils. And, but it's, it's so different, and it's so exotic that she is... Um, really drawing a crowd, isn't she? Yeah. So it's not her dancing, it's her what? Yeah, the mystery about her, the mystery yeah. about looks her. Too. And her, yes, her looks, yep, she has a great figure, but she's, but she's just, she's doing um, this exotic dancing, just getting very close without, you know. I know. <laughs> All right, thank you. I guess I, do, I, I don't really need to describe this to you, do I? All right, so who's, who's coming to her dances? Guys. Yes, 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 and, who want, and they all want to know her. They all want to be with her. And she's only going to be, pay attention to what kind of guys? Rich ones. Rich, ones. Rich, powerful men, because what is she trying to get back to? The way she used to yes, be. everything's been taken away from her, and now she's taken her life into her own hands using all she has is the only thing she has available to her. And she is going to make sure that she gets herself uh, back up into society. So all of the most powerful men, including royalty, they're all clamoring for her. And she has their attention. And then also, interestingly enough, she is accepted by high society. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's accepted by her because she's she's presenting this as a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah, she's. It, I, I guess it's like a, a a literal translation of the emperor's new clothes. Yep. <laughs> That's very good. I like that. <laughs> all right, so she's accepted by she's accepted by high society. And she's just traveling in those circles. She's back. She's where she wanted to be. And how is, um, how is she sustaining herself in addition to being paid for her performances? Well, all of those men are giving her what? Presents. She receives um, homes and furnishings and furs and jewelry and money and she is in great high demand she's in high demand and so uh, she's traveling all throughout Europe and she's performing and as she's doing that the newspapers want interviews with her correct mm -hmm. So everybody's interested. They want the backstory. They want to know who she is. So while she's doing these interviews, she is telling a different story. Remember her dad? Mm -hmm. Yes, and she wants to maintain the mystery. She knows that's the draw. That's the draw. She's using everything that she can to retain what she's got. So she never tells the same story twice, all right? Yeah, she never tells the same story twice. Every, everywhere she goes, she's got like some different um, wonderful exotic, she's, no one knows where she's from. Nobody knows that she's got 
a, a real name and that this is a, a pseudonym. Nobody knows that. So she's telling the same, uh, telling the different story over and over and over again, and that's going to come back to bite her. All right. Now, time goes by, yes, and her fame is great. And so what do you think other younger women are doing? All right, I love this quote. I don't think imitation is the highest form of flattery. I think it's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Pink. Yes, yes, it's a quote, it's a quote from... Her. It's a quote from Pink, yes, but I thought it was very appropriate. Yes. Because Matahari thought it was very annoying too. They're taking her thunder. Now what's happening with her? All right, she's, she's, this is her, this was her ticket out. This is her life. She lives this high society life, but eventually what's gonna happen? It happens to every one of us. It's all the old. She's getting older and she has these younger women that are doing her thing and maybe they're more experienced and better trained dancers. Remember, she just took a couple of classes, but they're doing what she did. And so now she is looking at losing the thing that propelled her. All right, she's getting fewer and fewer requests for her performances. Um, she's, still, she's still a beautiful woman, but she's not getting the same kind of um, attention that she'd been getting before. So what she decides to do is she's got to up the ante, right? So she writes a performance, and she has to make it like outrageous and shocking. So she's going to do a dance. She's going to perform a dance she wrote herself, and it's about a priest who falls in love with a goddess. So you know it's going to be... Yeah, uh, it's probably going to be something um, over the top. And she has been offered a theater in Berlin where she can perform uh, this dance, her show. So she goes to Berlin. Of course, she's going to go and do that. That's, she needs it, right? Mm -hmm. So she arrives, and when she arrives, the year is 1914. Oh, yeah. She arrives in Berlin in 1914, and when she gets there, um, Germany has declared war on Russia, and then immediately declares war on where? France. On France, all right? And where has she lived for the past 10 years? Paris. Paris, all right? So they've shut down her show. Her show is shut down. She's been in Paris, they're, they're, Germany's at war with Paris, she's been living in Paris for the last 10 years, that makes her a citizen, so what they do with all of her money? They confiscate it. Yeah, 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 they have frozen all of her assets, all right, yes. And the um, other thing that they do in, in the theater, because she had spent money, they spent money on uh, setting up the stage and her performance, and so they um, confiscated her furs and jewelry as payment for, what, for the money they extended in preparation for her performance. So she can't even like sell her pearls. Like, she can't sell her fur coat. She is penniless. She is now absolutely penniless. And she can't go back. They're not going to let her go back to France, are they? So where does she have to go? She has to go home. She has to go home. So she does. She goes back home. And while she's there, she's making money um, as a model. These are some of her photos. All right, she's earning some money. She's surviving just barely as a, as a model. Here's a couple more. All right. But then she says she just got bored. She was struggling. Where does she really want to be? She wants to be in Paris. She wants to be where the excitement is. 
And so after about a year, she goes back to Paris, but it's not the same. It's just not, obviously, not the same thing because they're in the middle of a war. So there she is in Paris, and everybody knows her, right? Everybody knows Mata Hari. And so now, all of a sudden, uh, the Parisian government is wondering, why? Why is she back? Why is she here? Why is she in Paris? And it is a time of paranoia, isn't it? Any war would be, right? So there's rumors about her. There's rumors and there's suspicion. Okay, why is Mata Hari back in Paris? She consorts with powerful men, right? She knows everybody at the top levels. She speaks several languages. Remember she got a great education? All right, and then she, when she was married, um, she had to speak other languages um, as well. So she knows several languages and she knows the powerful people. She knows powerful people. So that now they've got her under surveillance because they don't know why she's back. They don't understand why she's back. When she's there, she meets this young Russian soldier, Trudy. That's Russian. Vladimir the Maslov? I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, I thought you were just going to know everything that I pointed no, I to Russian. today. That's Russian. Va Vadim. All right, we're going to call him Vadim. So, she, so he's younger. This Russian soldier is um, quite a bit younger than she is, but he falls in love with her. He knows who she is, and he's just, he, he's just starstruck. And he falls in love with her, and he asks her to marry him, and she agrees. She agrees. She's ready to settle down. She's getting older, and she wants something more stable. So, and it seems like she really, truly is in love with this man. But he's a soldier, and he's off in the um, war zones, isn't he? He's fighting. He's battling. She wants to go and meet with him, but because there's a war going on, she can't just go into that war zone area. She needs special permission to do that. And in order for her to get special permission, she has to meet with this man, okay, George Ledoux. He is the head of the French counterintelligence. And guess what? He's had his eye on her. Remember, she's under surveillance. She thinks she's going because she needs special permission to go meet the man she loves, to go be nearer the man that she loves. All right? But when she arrives to get permission, she, he's going to interrogate her. And he says to her, why were you in Berlin right when the war broke out? Remember, she was going to do a performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's going to do a performance, and she's saying, I was going to do a performance. And it got canceled because of the war. But he's not buying that. He's very, very suspicious of her. You can understand why he would be, too, though, right? Because of who she knows. and you, So you can understand that. And she was in Germany at that time. And why was she back in France? So all of these things. All of these things. Are you OK? All right, so he or she suggests to him, because he, she can tell where the conversation's going, she's being interrogated. And so she suggests to him, well, you know, I could be a spy for France. She offers. She offers to be a spy. She tells Ledoux, all right, I will go to Berlin. All right, I still know high-level people. I'll go to Berlin and I will get information and I'll get it back to you. And all you have to do is pay me, I know I have dollar, US dollars, <laughs> but one million francs. She wants one million francs. And so he tells her yes, but he has no intention of paying her. Um, he, t he tells her yes. So she's gonna go off to Berlin and then she thinks this money is gonna get her to the war zone and get her to the love of her life, that this is gonna solve all their problems. That's why she's asking for that um, huge amount of money that he has no intention of ever paying her. So she goes off to, she's on her way to Berlin to do this spying and get this intel. 
and uh, she, she doesn't quite make it, all right? On her way there, she gets stopped by Scotland Yard. All right, so she stopped in Great Britain. And the reason why she's stopped, here she is, this, this high society lady, um, and they think that she's a spy. All right, now they think that she's a spy because she's, she presents herself as someone they've been looking for, and when they see her passport, her passport does not say Matahari, because if it had, they'd known who she was. What does it say? A real name. It says her real name. It says Margareta Zell is what it says. And so they interrogate her. Um, all right, so they think that this is another spy named uh, Clara Benedix. So they're going to arrest her thinking that she's a different spy because they don't recognize her name. And this, um, these documents were declassified fairly recently, I think in 2017. Hmm. So you could look up these, these, uh, these documents. And this is, the, this is the interrogation. All right, and they're asking her about her name. And she's saying, no, it's a mistake that I'm not that's not who um, I am, and she tells them who she is, but she doesn't stop there. If only she did. If only she had stopped there, but she didn't. She was so intimidated. She goes on and she tells the whole story. She tells Scotland Yard that she is a spy for France. It's in here. It's right in here. All right, she's, tell here, she's telling the whole thing. And they're not even really sure um, if they believe her, so they're asking her to describe Ledoux. And she says, um, he was tall and fat, fatter than a man of 50. Yeah, I mean, she's just, she just blurts out everything. If she's a spy, she's not a very good one. Okay, she just, what? Yeah, she's not. Yeah, she's not. Yeah, she's not too good at it. So uh, Scotland Yard contacts Ledoux, and he says, um, "Yeah, I did say. That I, you know, I, I said that to her, but it was, it was just a ploy. Um, I was had her under surveillance going into Berlin. So you guys got her. Just send her back to me now. Send her back. So she has to go back to France." All right, now what's happening in France? They're losing. they're losing. Yes, exactly, Judy. They are losing. And they're thinking somebody is betraying them. Someone's betraying them because they're losing. Tens of thousands of soldiers are dying, and there is very little gain. All right, they're well, not. They're refusing to fight. They've lost so much and we're done. Exa yes, so, so much. Did everyone hear what Judy said? So many of the soldiers were lost, were killed, that soldiers then started to refuse to fight. So it was going so badly, so badly, and they needed an answer. Did they need a scapegoat? Absolutely. That's one of the questions. That's one of the questions. They might have needed a scapegoat at this point in time. So when Matahari returns to France, she is arrested. They arrest her. They interrogate her 17 times. And 17 times she tells the same story. Her story does not change. It doesn't change. So they're not sure what to do with her. They have her um, in custody for months, for a total of six months um, before it gets worse for her. While she's in custody, she's got all these, these um, high-positioned friends, and she's writing to them, writing to them, writing to them. Do you think anybody responded? Oh, no. mm -hmm. Do you think anyone came to her assistance? None, none of these people, not one, not one person came to her aid. Now, after six months, France Ledoux gets a break. He gets a break, and the break that he got was 
um, they intercepted some radio messages from Germany. It was in code, all right, so it was in code. So France is getting these messages in a code, but in a code that they have already broken. They've already broken this code. So they can read the code. And what they're reading is that there is a payment of 20,000 francs, I didn't have the symbol on my keyboard, um, to agent H21, H21. And guess where those payments, the payments match up to an account for Matahari. Oh, now things are looking a little more suspicious. Mm -hmm. Okay, things are looking a little bit more suspicious. Okay, so these payments are going to her for sure. She's receiving them for sure. So Ledoux has the evidence that was eluding him. He's got it in these transmissions. Right? Now, one thing to think about, these are German transmissions in code. We don't have the original message, do we? All we have is the French translation. That's all we have, the French translation of these uh, radio transmissions. All right, but they present her, Madhari, with this new evidence in another interrogation. And when she hears the evidence that they've got, she says to them, she makes this statement, today I tell you the truth. Today I'll tell you the truth. All right, so now she's gonna tell everything, everything. Remember she's intercepted by Scot Scotland Yard and she's sent back mm -hmm. to France. Mm -hmm. On her way back, she makes a little um, stop in Madrid. Who wouldn't? <laughs> and she's there for a couple of weeks. Now, while she's there, she is, now she's under surveillance by both um, Scotland Yard and Ledoux. They're, these countries are watching her, right? And she has rendezvous with a gentleman at least three times. And this gentleman is a German military attache and she meets with him at least three times they know that they know that all right now she claims she says that she got information from him she met him because she wanted to follow through with her promise that she would spy and that she got information while she was with him, and she sent telegrams to Ledoux. Ledoux never responded to her and said he didn't get them. He never got these. So a couple of things here, a couple of things here. Did she send them? Is it true when she sent them and the Germans intercepted them? That's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it also possible that Ledoux was setting her up because they needed a scapegoat. So he's not going to respond to her and not going to admit that he ever received them. If he had, would that let her off the hook? Would that prove her innocence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would prove that she was giving the intel that he had sent her out to do, even if he did it nefariously. But no one, no one ever saw them. So they were intercepted. He's not acknowledging them, or she never sent them. Okay, so that's a question. Now, she tells more truth. Remember, when the war broke out and she had to go back to the Netherlands, she had to go home, remember that? And she spends a year and she's modeling. Well, she's also met with this man. He is a German um, Secret Service member stationed in Amsterdam, and she meets with him. And when she meets with him, he offers to pay her to be a spy for Germany. 
All right, so now we're backtracking, but no one, this is what she, she's telling, she's telling this in the last interrogation. All right, so while she was in Amsterdam, she is meeting with this man and he is trying to um, recruit her, recruit her as a spy because she would be perfect. She really would be perfect. And he's going to pay her a sum of money. Guess how much money? 20,000 20, francs. So, as she's explaining in the interrogation, um, she said no, but she took the money. She said no, I'm not going to do that, but she did take the money. She didn't say no until after she received the money. And she thought she was being very, very clever, because if you remember all the way back, when she was supposed to do her performance in Berlin, what did they hold hostage? She figured 20,000 francs would repay her quite nicely for the, her possessions that they confiscated. So she kept the money, but says that she wasn't going to do any spying or betraying France. That was her country she loved should live there for so long. And so that was her explanation. And she, in the interrogation, tells this whole story, fills in the gaps of that year she was in the Netherlands and while she was in Madrid. She fills in the gaps. So, but this is all they need, and they need a scapegoat. France needs a scapegoat because they are losing so badly. So they put Matahari on trial. The trial lasts two days. Two days. She has a lawyer appointed to her, uh, but he had very limited access to her. He did the best he could. Um, but ultimately, she is tried in two days. She's convicted as a traitor, and she is sentenced to execution by firing squad, by firing squad. October 15th, 1917, she faces a firing squad. It is said that she was offered a blindfold and she refused. She wanted to stare her executioners in the, in the face. She wanted to look them in the eye while they did um, this thing. And so she, what? The blindfolds for the shooters. So she, so she refused the blindfold, um, and it was uh, said it was a noble way to die, that it was a brave way for her to die. And of course, it hits the papers, right? Yeah. It hits the papers, and there's a lot of speculation because. She has now been involved in Great Britain, Germany, France during a, a world war, and she's very controversial. Do you think any one of those countries want to claim her body? No. Yeah. None of those countries <clears throat> wanted to claim her body. So there's no grave. Now it's um, re reported or recorded that her body was given to science, but nobody can find her remains to this day, to this day. And so, because nobody wanted her body, it is said that she was given to science, there is no grave, and so she comes down through time as what? There's all kinds of stories that she, um, she seduced the firing squad and they let her go. <laughs> or that, yeah, yeah right. that's one of them. Or so that crazy. one of one of her lovers came swooping through and picked her up and off they went and she escaped. Oh, so there's all, all kinds of, all kinds of um, stories. So she goes on and on. Um, 
uh, down through time as this great legend, but the question still remains, even though the documents are unsealed now and we can read them, it doesn't really answer anything, does it? No. It's still, it's still, was she a spy? Was she a double spy? Was she just this brilliant femme fatale? Or was she a scapegoat? We still don't know. Yeah. We still don't know. Okay, so are you liking this series? Is espionage good? Is it a good thing? Yes. You want me to go on with it? Because next week I am ready with... Pinkerton. Oh, Pinkerton. Yeah. Okay. Yes, do you want to hear about Alan Pinkerton and the sure. whole Pinkerton? Yeah. Uh, yes, all right, very good. So next week we'll just keep going on with this and uh, we're going to do... Pinkerton Detective Agency precursor of the FBI. All right, everybody, thank you for coming, and I will see you next week.